Hello, and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, Episode 7, Tech at the Table. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone hanging out in the lobby here on Twitch. It's a pleasure to see people interested. For those listening to the podcast, you can join us starting September 19th every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Audience feedback. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of that feedback, positive or negative. Chris Groff on G Plus wrote in with some more game suggestions based on the questions we answered for episode six. For Daniel and his short area control games for three players, Kemet, Tiny Epic Kingdoms, and Quantum. For Steve, looking for a next step up from Splendor, Dominion, and other deck builders like Star Realms. And lastly, for Charlie, Jackson, uh, Charlie Jackson, Chris notes is a two-player version of Ingenious, and again recommends Azul. Thanks, Chris. Uh, some solid recommendations there. Speaking of Charlie Jackson, he had some extremely positive feedback on our answers to his question. Uh, direct to me, he wrote, "Wow, you did a phenomenal, thorough, and terrific job answering that question. Thanks very much." Well, thank you for asking. But then he followed up with a public tweet that really impressed me. Awesome. I asked at Tabletop Bellhop a question, and he answered it on his blog, and he did a stellar job with it. Even after Googling quite a bit myself, I never came up with half of his answer. And the half I didn't find was really unique and cool. So there you have it. Out on the web, we're better than Google. Well, thanks, Charlie. <laughs> we get better with your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or Sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhop's tabletop? Every week, I like to take, look, take a look back at the games we've played, any events we've attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of hashtag what did you play Mondays every week at tabletopbellhop.com. So the big thing that happened for both of us last week was QCC or Queen City Conquest. This was a small RPG focused con in Buffalo, New York. Both Sean and I got in a lot of gaming. Like personally, I played six different mostly indie RPGs and also got in some board gaming. A great con with some great gaming memories, both board game and RPG for both of us. There's so much to say about QCC, in fact, that we recorded a special episode of Tabletop Bellhop last night. You can see it now over on Twitch, or wait for it to hit your podcatchers and YouTube this weekend on Saturday morning. Yeah, that's a long episode. We go for about an hour and 45 minutes talking QCC. Lots of love for that con. Absolutely. Due to the fact we were at QCC and didn't record an episode last week, so we weren't on last Thursday. Sorry if you came looking for us and missed us. Uh, our look back this week goes back two weeks. Now, during those two weeks, I didn't get a ton of gaming in. There were three games, though, two of which tie in really good with this episode. So things kind of worked out that way. And, well, part of it's pre-planning. I'm going to save those for last, though. Well, there's a tease for you all. Now, don't leave us <laughs> guessing. What's up first? Uh, the first game's Gaia Project. Now, this is a follow-up to Terra Mystica. Terra Mystica is a big, I would say, heavy Euro game. Lots of variety. One of the most asymmetric games out on the market where I think there's 14 different races you can play. Fantasy, world, uh, not world building, exploration, city building, empire building. Probably, probably falls under the 4X category. Uh, Fairly solid game. I didn't get to the table a lot because it's not easy to teach because besides all the different factions, there's, I think, 11 different actions you can take each turn. And each one's easy to explain, but all of them together is a bit much. So now, fast forward a few years, Gaia Project is released. Now, this is the same designer taking all the feedback they got on Terra Mystica and releasing a fixed version. 
It was very, very similar. Now, a friend of mine, Chad, brought the game to Brimstone so I could try it. I'd seen him playing it there. I got a hold of him. I'm like, I got to try this game. It was so similar to Terra Mystic. I would say like 85 to 90% the same game. It's also, as I mentioned, been a while since I played Terra Mystica. So the biggest thing, I think I need to play both again to make a final call. Right now, based on that one play, I would say Gaia Projects improves on Terra Mystica a couple steps. If you already own Terra Mystica, do you need to get Gaia Project? Well, I'm not rushing out to buy it yet. But maybe I just haven't seen the idiosyncrasies. Now, if you don't own Terra Mystica, seriously, skip it. Go buy Gaia Project. It's definitely a step above. Now, for people who care a lot about theme, and some of the feedback we've gotten from the show is we don't talk enough about theme. Terra Mystica's fantasy. You got orcs, dwarves, fantasy races. Gaia Project is aliens expanding in space. The games are similar enough. If you really prefer one of those two themes, go with the theme that your group's going to like better. Makes sense. So you mentioned uh, four. It was a. You think it was a four X game? What do you mean by that? Okay, here's where I, I may fail my uh, my game cred. Okay, it's a certain style of game, mostly made famous in the video gaming industry, and that's where the term came up. And it has to do with games like Civilization or Masters of Orion are the two games that people tend to put out. And there are four X's. There's Explore, Exterminate, Exploit, and Expand. I had to get them all. And that's generally what you do in these games, right? So you're exploring the board. You start off in a small area, you explore out. Uh, and you're finding new territories. You're going to expand. You start with one small city and expand your way out. In Gaia Projects, you start with two planets. You don't expand your way out. Um, exploit has to do with using resources. So there are resources on the board. If you're thinking Civ, it's sending your farmers out, making sure you hit the fishing spot, making sure you have the mines. And then, of course, exterminate is the PvP aspect. Now, actually thinking about it that way, Terra Mystica and Gaia Project, I would call 3X games. There's no way to wipe out your opponents. There's no war. The only thing you can really do is the same thing you can do in Catan where you can cut someone off. So 3X games, but a lot of people still throw them into 4X games, but it only uses three of the 4Xs. Makes sense. I, you, you had tied it in with in your in a sentence with heavy games, so I wasn't quite sure yeah. whether 4X was relating to heavy games or something altogether. All right. No, what most 4Xs are not light games, I will admit. Understandable. So having to cover all four of those aspects, you've got to have a lot of rules there. All right. Now, what about these two games that tie in with our topic for later? Right. So our topic today is tech at the table, technology at the table. When originally writing up the blog post for this question, I knew I wanted to try some of the newer games that have come out that are, are tied to apps closely, where you need an app of some sort to be able to play the game. So before I wrote the blog post, I managed to get in Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition. Since then, I got to play XCOM. So I say it's somewhat fortuitous because if it wasn't for writing that article, I would have never pushed to get these games to the table. But it does work out well that we had the one-week gap, so I was able to get two of them in, which is really neat. Well, I'm not familiar with Mansions of Madness, but I am a huge XCOM video game fan. So I can't wait to see how it plays on the table. Well, you'll have to wait for that one because I'm going to do Mansions of Madness first because I'm going chronological. And I guess today is all about sus uh, suspense. I'm building up suspense, this issue. It's, it's the, the, the hidden RPG topic while I'm talking about board games. <laughs> so Mansions of Madness is a Call of Cthulhu board game. It's in the Eldritch Horror series of games for Fantasy Flight games. So we're talking the whole mythos, Cthulhu, spooky 1920s horror. I did not like the original Mansions of Madness. It seemed like a solid game. It was a big box fantasy flight game with a million bits and little hobbit-sized cards, but it was just too fiddly. It was fiddly and fragile. So one of the biggest problems with the game, it was player versus players or one versus many. So you had a keeper, which was like the dungeon master, and you have all the players, and the keeper has to set the game up. So you go through a book and you get the scenario, and setting it up was like, to be honest, it's been a little while since I played, so I may get the numbers off. But it was like stacking two or three cards, then putting a clue token on it. Then in a different tile, making sure you're on tile 003A, not 003B, putting two different cards in a different order with a different token on it. And doing that about eight places on the board. 
So when the players are playing, they're like, we look at that clue when you flip over the top card and something happens. And if you so happen to it, put down the wrong card. <laughs> exactly. That was exactly it. Now, the other thing is it's a fantasy flight game. These They don't make quick games, right? Like fantasy flight are, are Marathrash games in the fullest. They're immersed in theme. There's dice. There's creepy stuff on the cards. And you're playing for a good hour and a half to two hours, if not longer. To find out that the keeper put the wrong clue in the wrong spot in that last hour or in that last 15 minutes really stinks. Plus, one versus many games, I love that in RPGs. I don't like it in board games. The one versus many thing, I, I run a lot of RPGs and I want to be a fan of the players. I want to help them win. And when you're playing these board games, that's not the point. It's supposed to be adversarial. And I find that difficult playing that role like, I want the good guys to win. I want the hero. I want to see what's going to happen in the story. Whereas here, I'm trying to use the Cthulhu monsters and crush, just crush everyone. So I picked up Mansion of Madness 2nd Edition when Geektropolis went out of business. I probably would have avoided it with how much I dislike the original. But I got a great price on it. So And then doing writing about tech on the table, I decided to check it out. I am extremely impressed. So the biggest thing they did was they got rid of the Keeper. Your app is your keeper. It's your dungeon master. So now it's a pure co-op game. So I don't have to worry about it. I want the heroes to win because I'm one of them, right? So we're all on the same side. The app does some really cool things. One of the things I really liked, and now maybe this was in the original game, but I'm not sure, but no one at the table knows how to win when you start playing. And I thought that was fantastic. And that really adds to that mystery feel. Like you feel like you're playing a mystery because all you know is you've gone to this haunted house to investigate a missing person. And that's it. Like, you honestly don't know how to win or lose the game. It's you're in a room, there's a clue over here, there's doors over here, and there's a pile of rubble in the corner. What do you do? It's very RPG like that way without even a DM. So it's not even like there's that one player who can kind of give the hints. The app also randomized everything. So, from what I know from the original game, what I remember, when you attacked a monster, you flipped over a card and read how it attacks. This is now all done by the app. So, all that randomization is all automatic. So if you fought something in the game, you would tap on what they call the monster box and all the monsters would show up and you tap on it and you'd say what type of weapon you were attacking with, whether it was um, it was blade, heavy weapon, fists or ranged weapon are your choices. And then it would tell you what to do. And one of the things I really like, and this actually carries over from the first game, is that you would think in a game like that, if you're like the dude with the machete, you're going to be rolling strength all the time. And it's not. It's really well done. So even if you're attacking with the bladed weapon, it may say the monster tries to deke you out. You have to roll mind to be able to hit him. Or the next time it might say you panic and throw your machete at him, roll agility. And then the third time you might roll strength. So I like that because it really balanced out the characters. And like a character that had just high mind, like the, the doctor, could still win a fight versus the weird-ass Cthulhu monster. The other thing the game, the app, sorry, really helped was it added atmosphere. Like it had a soundtrack. There were creepy sounds. And when events in the game happened, it had appropriate sounds. In the adventure we played, the house was being torn apart by a portal up in the upstairs. And the game kept playing like ripping wood and twisting metal sounds. It was very cool. And it, it worked. Like it got you into the game. At the start and end of the module, there was voice acting. So it read out the story. I tracked the monster's health. health it tracked the character's health. It was just very well done. And then there was a little added bonus that I didn't know was in there when I first got the game of their puzzles in the game. And now when you have the puzzle, you literally hand the tablet to whoever has to solve the puzzle and they're supposed to do it without help. And that was really well done. So there was like mastermind style where it's pick between these runes and you have two runes right and one in the right place. There was uh, sliding puzzles, the usual swap two. And then there was the... I. I I don't know what you call the style of puzzle, but Traffic Rush is the one I remember plastic, where you put the cars in and you have to try to get the one car to escape by sliding the other ones out of the way. There was at least those three types of puzzles and there were maybe more. And it was just neat because now the app didn't know everything. So you still needed the board game. You couldn't just play the app. So one example of that is if you were the one solving the puzzle, you only got as many turns as your mind stat. So you would use the app, you would make your, say my mind was two, my two moves on the sliding puzzle, then I'd have to put it down. And then the next person that went to continue the puzzle, and this is another bonus of the app, it reminded, remembered where you were, so the next person could start the puzzle. Meanwhile, obviously inside the app, something was counting down how many we tried. 
we just played the intro scenario and then we played it a second time, but only part way through to see how much it changed. This is my one worry about the game is that it may not be overly replayable, but there are like 13 missions in there. And if I get 13 plays out of a game, I'm happy. But for some people, it may not be enough. But like we did replay the beginning of the first one. The map did change. Uh, what the butler was doing changed. And the starting equipment we had changed. And some of the monsters that came out changed. So it seemed like enough. That even though I know that the very end of this mission is this portal tearing apart the building and trying to stop it, stuff does change along the way. So I do think it's worth replaying. Excellent. Well, sounds like they've uh, done some serious improvements to that. But there are also a lot of Cthulhu games out there. So even if they hadn't, one less isn't really <laughs> the end of the world. <laughs> That's true. I, I do strongly suggest skip the first one. Like, if you find Man to the Madness first edition for sale... Actually, wait. Let me correct that. If you find it cheap enough, pick it up, because I totally forgot about this until you mentioned that. If you own the first game, you can integrate it with the second game. And that's actually something else the app does that's really cool, is if you tell it what expansions you have, it will then use that content randomly through all the missions. So if I had told it I own Mansion of Madness First Edition, it might have been the layout of the house might have had a room from the original game. Or it might have had one of the monsters from the original game. Or when we were picking characters, we would have got the pick from both sets. Now, I didn't like the first one enough. I sold my copy before getting the second copy, so I didn't get to see that integration. But it is very cool. Interesting. All right. Well, let's hear about XCOM now. This is, oh, yeah. this is what I'm so, here for. XCOM is older, like 2014, I think. So board game world, that's fairly old. It's one of the first app integrated games. It's where you actually have to have an app. I did not play it for two years and for two reasons. The main thing is when I think XCOM, I think dudes on a map, on a grid with so many command points, spending so many command points to walk forward and one command point to switch weapons, another command point to move, putting my guys on Overwatch. Then once I'm done my mission, getting my team back and them getting XP, having to train new guys because obviously a couple guys died. Like to me, that's the XCOM experience. When I bought the game, I might have pre-ordered it. I don't remember. But I know I bought it without realizing when I got it home, there's no squad combat in it, which is even stranger because it comes with... And we seem to be having some technical difficulties. We'll be trying to get back as soon as we can. Oh, I see your video. Oh, your video is back. Okay, yeah, we seem to be back. Excellent. That was Discord. I'm showing red on Discord now. Oh. Like horrible connection. All right, mine mine was bad, but now it's good. <laughs> huh. I have no idea. I'm going to blame that one on Discord, not on us. Okay. So, Does everyone else see us? Are we back? Uh, there's, nobody, there's nobody but bots in the room. Uh, <laughs> wow, that stinks that we're not getting... Is it because we recorded Wednesday? Maybe people thought we weren't going to be here Thursday? Uh, maybe. Oh, well. It's all good. All right, let's go back to XCOM. So, I don't know there where is we cut no... off. There is no squad combat, and you're surprised because in the box there are... Miniatures. There are miniatures for the four different types of troops. I don't remember, though. There's a sniper, the heavy, the guy with the shotgun. Support. And support, and then one more. It's a um, dude with a pistol. Officer or something. Commander. commander. Uh, yeah, whatever the commander was. Whatever. Four thing. types of dudes. Like, highly detailed, nice, like, cool mini or not level miniatures. Mm -hmm. And then miniatures for little UFOs and interceptors. So I just thought miniature game. These could be counters. Like there's like it's cool they're miniatures and it looks nice, but there's really no reason for them to be miniatures. Side note, friend of mine, Dave Garby, is very upset by this because he's a miniature painter and he really wants XCOM miniatures. And he thinks it of, of it as damn board game companies trying to get the miniature gamers to buy their games. To each their own. Anyway. I want squad-based XCOM. I still want it because this game I bought is not that. It is pretty much everything else XCOM, though, which is kind of cool. So I didn't grab it because of that. 
The other reason is there's no instructions in the book and box, and that drives me nuts. Like, I teach this when we talk on this show, be prepared. Our whole teaching episode is about have the game laid out, read the instructions ahead of time, have player handout. I couldn't do any of this. There is a one-page sheet that goes, go download the app here. That's it. And that frustrated me personally. I don't like reading the rules when we're there. So I left it on my shelf. I I kind of wanted to try it. I heard a couple good things, but I had no big desire. And then, well, I wrote the article on tech at the table and wanted to know, well, let's try out this app-based game, see if it's any good. So going to the actual game. It's four players. Each player plays four roles. There's the commander who is in charge of the budget and in charge of crises happening, mitigating crises, as well as putting the interceptors out on the board. There's communications who runs the app and then communicates to other players with the app saying they're also in charge of the satellites. There is research who is in charge of deciding which uh, text to research and then assigning scientists to each tech. And then there's the military who uses all those miniatures to send them on missions or to defend the base. And that is pretty much everything players do. So what happens is there's a real-time part where you start up the app, and it's got dramatic sounds right from the game. Actually, uh, Sean Hamilton noted that the sound effects and loading screens are right from the game. So if you're into the modern XCOM, that's something that'll suck you in. Like he said, as soon as I heard that dun, 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 sound where it's you're about to start a mission, he's like, oh, yeah, we're playing XCOM. So the app will sit there and it'll pick one of the players. And I don't know how it decides who. It's obviously based on something the app handles and why you need an app. But it picks one of the four players and it'll say, do something. So it'll say, like, commander, there is a crisis. And then immediately it starts counting down. So the communications officer who has the tablet then has to tell the commander, hey, you have a crisis. You need to do something about it. And they are waiting for the millisecond the commander's done to hit stop. Now, if you don't, you have what they call pause time, where it'll pause, but then it uses up another counter that's in the background. And if you eventually run out of, bat of pause time, more bad things happen in the game. But you don't see this. And you're not told how much pause time you have. So then the commander does his thing. And his is, if it was a crisis, it's draw two crisis cards, pick which one's going to happen, put the other one away. And then the next one might be, Commander, set the budget for the year. And then it tells you what your yearly budget is based on the panic levels of all the different areas of the world, just like in the game. So it'll say whatever. You have a, a budget of 11. Then it'll say scientists, uh, research tech three. And that'll mean the scientist grabs a bunch of tech cards and puts one into slot three. And then it keeps going through the different roles. I'm not going to explain how to play every role. But basically, as you're playing through this phase, you're going to allocate resources and then bad guys are going to show up. So you're going to put UFOs on the various continents, or you're going to put them out in orbit. Once the app is done, you get one last chance to, to use abilities. And then you turn the app off, and you play through everything that happened. So you don't turn the app off, but it's not real time anymore. Like, again, it walks you through steps. So it'll say, first off, scientists, finish all your research. So then the scientist sits there and determines how the research went. And the way all of these work is it's a push your luck based die mechanic where you have D6s where only two of the six sides are successes and you have a D8. And it's kind of weird because the number of things you assigned are the number of blue dice that you roll with the successes. So if the scientists put three scientists on the tech, they would roll three dice. If they only put one scientist on the tech, they only roll one die. And you're rolling trying to get those success symbols. At the same time, you're rolling the alien die, which is the D8. And it starts off with a number, like a, what do they call it? Severity, critical rating, whatever. How bad it is, rating of two. So you're rolling all your blue dice. And if you roll a two on that red die, you lose. And then you can keep trying. And if you don't have enough successes, you can keep trying to develop that tech. You roll again. And on the red die now, if you get a three, so a one, two, or a three, you failed. And then if you still don't have enough successes, you could try again. And if you have a one, two, three, four, you fail. And it keeps going all the way up to, I think, six is as hard as it gets, which is pretty bad. You only have a two and eight chance of succeeding. So the scientist does that. Then the army guy sits and assigns people to the base defense or to running missions. The commander at one point needs to check the budget. So for every scientist assigned, every satellite out, and every troop put on the board, it costs one unit. And if you're over, the panic levels go up in two countries. 
Um, so you go around, do the push your luck thing, and basically figure out how bad it is. If there's any UFOs left on the board at the end of this phase, the panic level goes up. If there's any enemies still left in the base, the base can end up blowing up by the end of the game. Um, also along that base track, there are events based on what type of evading force is coming in, which is determined by a card. The important thing is it actually felt like everything about XCOM but the combat. That's it what was it sounds the- like. It's, it sounds yeah. like you're playing you know 85 percent of the xcom game just not yeah. that just not it the just, real the the, uh, the turn-based combat yeah it was just it, missing that one part that i wanted like fantasy flight come on like put out the other version heck put out a campaign game where when we run the mission we game up, come back i think that'd be phenomenal but I, I do strongly recommend it. It's it's a very cool game. It's I don't think it would be good with less than four players because then you're playing two roles each. But I haven't tried it to say otherwise. It is rather good. Well, it sounds pretty awesome, but I notice Anshi Games is complaining about how the learning process was without mm. those instructions. So, yeah, I mentioned that. There's no instructions, right? Even dumber, there was no reason not to have instructions. So we played the tutorial, and the tutorial basically gives you a thing to read to the other players at the table. It basically just gave me a digital rule book. And what it does is it goes, we're going to go real time, and as we get to each role, we're going to tell you what to do. So like earlier when I said, Commander, you need to deal with a thing. Well, it said, when the app loads, it will tell you one of the roles. One of the roles will be the Commander this time. So as a communications officer, you should tell the Commander it's their turn to act. And you basically sat there and had a... I'd guess about 32 page rule book that I had to read out loud at the table that just happened to be an app form instead of a sheet of paper, which is just frustrating because I could have read the sheet of paper ahead of time, had everyone show up and say, look, you're the commander. These are the kind of things you're going to do. These are the kind of things you're going to do. These are the kind of things you're going to do. And here's what I'm going to do. Like I'm teaching any other game in my collection. The fact that I couldn't do that. So anyone who owns it and doesn't want to go through this, like sit down and play through the game without the board there just to go through the tutorial app, and then you get to read everything. Right. All right. Well, that's good to know. Um, it still sounds interesting, so I think the next time I'm down, uh, sign me up. Uh, if, we yeah. can, if we can get the four, the four people in there. Now, on the podcast, we go through these games rather quickly to save time for our main topic. To hear more of the Bellhop's thoughts on these games, Check the On the Table section, tabletopbellhop.com. We record the show live Wednesday nights, starting next week, at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch. We encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby, thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. There's nobody here to talk about. So, <laughs> we're so, uh, it's quiet right now, and uh, just a reminder that we are watching the, lo- the lobby when we're here uh, talking on the podcast, so feel free to comment and ask questions. So I'm sure you caught that during the lobby check-in, but those, and those of you with good perception definitely caught it. You'll hear Sean say we record the show live on Wednesday nights, and today, right now, is Thursday nights. Well, right now, uh, we are announcing an official Thursday. This will be our last show recorded on Thursday night. The time and place won't change. There's still going to be 9.30 Eastern. We're still going to be right here on Twitch. We're just going to switch to Wednesday. This was being done for a couple reasons. The big one being that we don't want to record the same time as a rather popular D&D-based Twitch show is on. Well, you can find us all across the web now, and we grow by the support of listeners and viewers like you. So please, take a minute to subscribe to our content on your favorite platform. Give us a like, comment, or review on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you find us, and help spread our gaming advice to the world. One little bit of news, we're just now over 500 downloads on this podcast for a little over a month. Thank that you very is much. Fantastic. Now, iTunes reviews in particular help people find the show. Even if you don't listen on iTunes, it'd be awesome if you could drop us a review there, since it's the main index many of the podcatchers and podcasting sites use. If you stream on Twitch and are interested in a mutual hosting agreement, we'd love to hear from you. We host you, you host us, and everyone wins. Just contact Mo at tabletopbellhop.com and we can set something up. 
<laughs> I have to pause for a second because I'm glad Sean caught it and I didn't saw read it. what I typed. That's okay. You also <laughs> spelled you also spelled your own website wrong in your email address. Yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah, that <laughs> one's not as important as we, we host you, you, you hose us. us. <laughs> I, got, I got it. I was trying not to laugh while you were saying I, it. I, I was very carefully skipping over it and not reading the words <laughs> so that I didn't say it. Because I knew if I actually <laughs> stared at the word, oh. I would say it. That's funny. Oh. Yep. Wow. I. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, for the last three weeks, I've been having to reach to change Twitch.tv on the uh, on the bottom of the show notes because it's been spelled wrong and it keeps getting copied forward. Uh, Oops! I changed it today, so we shouldn't copy it forward anymore. We shouldn't. All right. Yeah, I know it's a couple of those every now and then. Okay. There we are. All right. Restarting. We're good, and we're on to you next. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your inbox. Every Wednesday, we'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you will find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. And it's really hard to read when the words are moving in front of my eyes. <laughs> I wasn't expecting wow. it to add another line. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Two outtakes. This is what we do. When no one shows up, everything yeah. crap. You guys All should be goes here to, to keep hell. us on track. Hey, Bloodluster is in there. Is that a real person or is this a new bot? I haven't seen Bloodluster before. Bloodluster. Blood for the blood god. That's like All the right. third episode we've said that in now, I think. Um, I, oh, no, I only typed it. Shipping corn. I typed it while you were while you were trying not to cut your fingers yesterday. That's what it was. Yes. Um, All right. One of my goals with this Twitch account was to do more live streaming than just recording Tabletop Bellhop Live. I want to do unboxings, box insert assemblies, spontaneous live chats, maybe even live game streaming, and actual plays. So to that end, I've swapped ISPs, internet service providers, and greatly increased my bandwidth. So expect to see more content here on our Twitch stream in the coming weeks. I've already played with a bit where we recorded me building the Gloomhaven town insert from Meeple Realty. And I think I've got most of the tech issues from yesterday worked out. If you're interested in watching live, the best place to follow is my Twitter account, at Tabletop Bellhop. Because there's where I'm going to announce ahead of time and always give you about half an hour's notice, if not more, than I'm going to stream live. I am hoping tomorrow to take that Gloomhaven insert and get everything from Gloomhaven into the insert. If you guys want to watch that, watch my Twitter. I'll let you know when we're going live. Each episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can head over to the webpage, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop. We need your questions. We never have enough questions. Your questions is what the show's about. We are a Q&A show. We don't want to be an A show. I don't know what that is, but it sounds dirty. Today's question. On Facebook, Drew Sanderson asks, does technology at the table help, or can it be a distraction? Yes. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end. Well, I don't think we can get off that easy this week. <laughs> I can hear people shaking their pitchforks already. Okay, okay. Yes, tech at the table can help, and yes, it could be a distraction. It all depends on what it's being used. Now, this is a pretty hot button topic. I can't believe the amount of feedback I've gotten since I originally replied to this answer on the on the blog. Like crazy feedback. Some of which we probably cover on the feedback part in the next episode. Let's just say this is something people are passionate about. <laughs> and the other thing that's worth noting is most people don't agree with me in this case. So I have a feeling this conversation is going to be me trying to change some people's minds. Now, this is a very personal topic. There are different generations involved here. And a lot of this, I think, depends on how and when you were brought up. We grew up and were brought up without that technology available, except in a different room. You went somewhere to access the computer and at later points, the internet, you had to, you know, deal with your mom picking up the phone and disconnecting you from the internet once <laughs> you finally got on. We knew how to whistle the ATA tones for connecting to a Hayes <laughs> modem. And now 
these kids are growing up, and my kids, your kids are growing up with technology in their hands. It they don't know it's a way with to to operate without technology, and so that's a lot of I think where this this push and shove, push and, and and push back and forth is coming from on how technology is used gaming and everywhere else. True, I think another big part of it too is some people have had the problem and some haven't. So if you've had a very bad experience with tech, you're now no tech done bad. I've had that one bad experience. Whereas other people are like, I don't see the problem. I, again, kind of metaphors, a lot of issues that are going on. So I'm certain everyone here in the lobby, listening at home in your car, whatever, knows the bad side. Like, you know that cell phones can be distractions. You know what it's like to be in the middle of the game and someone gets a text. You know that, like, some, all of a sudden someone's music starts playing in the middle of your tense moment in an RPG. Someone's phone goes off for no reason. The player who's been on their phone the entire time and you go on around, you're playing an intense game, and it's like, hey, it's your turn. And they're like, oh, what? What's going on? And they haven't paid attention. They need you to recap the last turns. All the bad things. Like, there's a reason a lot of groups have no cell phone rule. Like, leave them at the door, leave them at the table. And I'm not just talking about that you want to socialize. This is, like, it can get bad. And this is Everyone's the same reason. Seen it. This is the same reason a lot of people have no cell phone rules at the dinner table. It's the, exactly. The dinner table and the board game and, and the gaming table are very similar in a lot of ways. It's a community group activity, and if you're on your cell phone, in many cases, you're with a different group and a different community, not interacting with the one at the table. I agree. So my point here is that I don't think I need to sit here and tell you about the bad aspects. I think everyone's seen it. If you haven't seen it personally, you've seen someone rant about it online, or you've heard someone rant about it in person, Every excuse me. Everyone's heard or seen the bad of cell phones. So what I want to do is highlight the good that tech at the table can bring to your game night. And I'm going to look at, uh, I think it's about eight different aspects of tech at the table in a positive light. There's so many ways that it can help you from when we talked about our learning episode, going using all yeah. those available resources to, to learning, to getting hints, tips, or as we as we learned in some of our earlier games, actually playing the game itself. Correct. So the biggest thing that tech gives us that we didn't have back in the day is instant access to information. Back in the day, if you're playing a board game, and I'm sure this has happened to most people, or even if you're out in the cabin and you have no cell access, when you did not get understand a rule, if there was a vague rule in the rule book, what happened? You argued about it. It may even broken out into a fight over some silly rule about, does that mean you land on the square or you land next to the square? Or line of sight. If any miniature gamer has ever seen line of sight rules, and, uh, there's millions. Just back in the day, what happened, unless there was, like, you hope there was an expert around. You hope there was a guy who's played more times than you. Like, if you're trying to figure out Starfleet Battles for the first time without access to an expert, there's someone who will tell you how to play. You Then you had your argument over the rules. You hopefully came to a consensus and then played that way forever and then just assumed that was the right way to play. Uh, that's how free parking on Monopoly probably came to be, right? And all the other house rules. Then maybe an FAQ came out, like you get an expansion for a game and you're like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that's how that was supposed to work. Or, hey, it took them three books to realize the first book's got a typo, but at least they're telling us now. Or they'd have a, a second printing. And then I remember this coming up with Battletech showing up at a uh, Windsor Gaming Society event and arguing the rules because one dude's rule book said one thing and the other dude's rule book said something different. And they were different printings. So this was the kind of thing that happened. So then uh, gaming magazines got more popular, right? Dragon, White Dwarf. So it'd be like anytime you got the new White Dwarf, especially White Dwarf with the Warhammer and Games Workshop games, the first place I'd look was the, the rule corrections, right? The other thing that people nowadays probably haven't seen is that many games used to actually come with a card in them that would sometimes have a phone number on them. That would be like, for rules questions, call. Now, I've never actually done that. But it was a thing. What I have done is I've actually written Games Workshop in the UK, 
mailed a letter to them with a question about Talisman, the board game, and received a response with them that included an FAQ, a, a rule summary. If you check out the blog post where I talk about this, I included a picture of the original envelope and, and the rule summary they sent me because I thought it was so cool that Games Workshop actually wrote me back and called me by name. Nowadays, none of this. Like, you don't need to do this. Like, the rules are in PDF. If I need to look up the rule question, heck, here's another one from back in the day. I lug my huge gaming bag down to the University of Windsor. I set up the game. I go to play, and I forgot the rule book on the kitchen table. Oh, we can't play today. No, not now. Now I grab my phone, and I grab the PDF copy of the rules, because I don't know a single modern board game where you can't find a PDF of the rules. There's also forums, FAQs published by the publishers. There's the individual game sites tend to have forums and FAQs. And then, well, there's the big bad boy in the room, Board Game Geek. Anything you want to know about any modern published board game and probably any old ancient published board game, you can find on Board Game Geek. The one other one that's really cool about today's uh, society and today's technology is social media. Everyone's connected and you can get instant answers, often from the actual game designers. This is something I don't even think of, but I will go online and I'll be like, man, anyone played, I can't think of an example right now. Anyone played XCOM, the board game? We can't figure out if you place two or three interceptors and all of a sudden someone will reply, you're like, oh, that's the game designer. That's awesome. Board Game Geek's really good for this too. The really good threads, you will have the game designer in there correcting things. And the game designers know this, like this is the place. That is just fantastic. And then last, you have access to all the other information. So if you really like a game, what other games are like this? Oh, I like this artist. Who drew this card? Uh, who did the background text and wrote the history for this race in battle lore? You can find all that. Like before, it'd be like, oh, this stuff was neat. And you kind of put it away. My, my concern, and I've brought this up a few times, and I just, it hasn't happened yet, but I see it on, on the horizon, is... Games, board games, card games are are moving towards a pot the potential of the video game uh, uh, world where they release it as fast as they can and they patch it with, a, with an FAQ on Board Game Geek or on their site and they, they throw a little card in there saying for, you know, before you play, check www.playthisgame.com for any rule updates or new whatever. And we're days from that yeah i could see it i i haven't seen it happen yet it's possible like uh like the best example now is the fact you buy a video game it doesn't even come with a rule anymore well, it doesn't even like come it, with the game most of the time anymore <laughs> well that's true that is true. You usually don't even get a physical game so the next thing is data collection uh most of us gamers are geeks nerds whatever you want to call us we like data. We like to analyze data. We like to collect data and put it in one place. Uh, for example, logging plays, win-loss history, doing the math. Like, remember when the teacher said you won't have a calculator at all times? Uh, BS, they were wrong. I've got one. Actually, it happens to be back there. I've got one. It's with me pretty much all the time. So there is lots of cool ways to gather this data. Again, Board Game Geek comes up, right? where you're going to be able to log your collection. Um, you're going to be able to look at it and say, what's my win-loss ratio? Even more so for a game designer, they can figure out the math easily. There's a site called antidie.com that does the math for any possible dice you want, custom sides or not. Stuff like that is fantastic. And then again, geeks dig this stuff, right? Like if they're sitting there and they always lose when they play Splendor, they can actually go and like, well, these cards do this, and there are sites out there that let us look this stuff up. Plus things like, when's the last time I played a game? Like, that's something that comes up being a podcaster. Someone will ask me, like, oh, blah, 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 you're talking about this game. When's the last time you played it? I don't remember. I go look it up on Board Game Geek. I have the data, and I can look that up instantly. Um, what you own. Uh, not everyone has this problem, obviously, but once you own a lot of games, it happens, especially with um, games with multiple expansions. I find miniature games like XCOM, I, or not XCOM, X-Wing, Star Wars X-Wing. I have a real hard time remembering which ships I own. I tend to buy them when they're on sale, and I forget exactly which ones I bought. Or Imperial Assault, same deal. I buy the expansion packs when they drop under 10 bucks, And I'm like, wait, do I own Bosk or is it Dengar I bought? And I can quickly look that up. Yeah, it happens. Everyone, I find every gamer gets that point at some point. 
So one thing that you get into is here with Board Game Geek now, we're actually gamifying the gaming. We're there. We're basically well, yeah. you. You're you, you. can now keep stats and score almost for the 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 meta concept of gaming. So you've got uh, you've got that going on. So uh, next, I want to talk about apps that improve your gameplay. Now these aren't app integrated games like Mansions of Madness. Com. These are apps created to work with your existing games. Now there's ones out there that are for specific games, like Renegade Games does some really fantastic app work for their games. So example, Fuse is a real-time dice rolling game where you're, it's, you're trying to roll dice with the other players and play them on cards really quickly. Well, if you use the Renegade Timer, something you don't need, it has this GLaDOS-like uh, AI that's talking to you and making fun of you as the ship is about to blow up you're on, right? And like you don't need this to play the game, but it improves the gameplay. It really sucks you in. Uh, another one is th there's got to be 100 apps for Gloomhaven being the number one game and a fairly complicated one. There are so many Gloomhaven trackers. I have one, I think it's just called Gloomhaven Tracker that I've got queued up ready for tomorrow, which takes out a lot of the setup of the game because it replaces every deck of cards in the game so that you literally, every monster, you have a thing and it flips over the monster card instead of having to have seven, eight, nine, uh, decks of cards out on the board. Uh, it also tracks monster hit points, stuff like that. From what I understand, there's a Gloomhaven one out there that almost makes it so you don't need the game. Um, another one, this is also Renegade Games, Clank. I still haven't tried it, but I know the Clank app from Renegade adds solo play. So you can play Clank by yourself without your friends. Very cool. Not needed, but very cool. And then there's other ones that, um, one of my favorites, it's only on iOS, is Start Player. What that's for is to determine who starts playing because every game's got some silly rule for start player or doesn't, says pick randomly. Start player, the game does that. When I first published this article, everyone talks about Chwazi, C-W-A-Z-I, I think it is. I don't have my phone on me. I think that's what it is. And it is literally a thing to pick between people. So what you do is you put your finger on the screen and it picks one of the fingers. And like people use this when they go out for dinner to determine who's going to pay. People use it for all kinds of things in real life. It's not designed just for board games, but board gamers have flocked to this app. What's really neat too is it works with teams. So say you're going to start like Battlestar Galactica and you need to know, who, I don't know, Battlestar Galactica, you don't know who's on teams. But if you had a team-based game, so it's your team of three versus my team of two. So uh, War of 1812 by Rebellion Games. Three of you play, uh, someone plays the natives, the Canadians and the British, and the other plays the American regulars and the American irregulars. You can each put down your five fingers and it'll pick the two teams. So it'll go, hey, you three red fingers are the Canadian side, you two blues are the US side. And I'm like, that's pretty neat. So I'm pretty impressed with Chwazi now that I have it. I put it on my phone. I still dig Start Player, Start Player, silly fun. It says stuff like whoever has the most buttons on their shirt plays first and it randomizes. But if you don't, not into that, because some people don't like that, they don't like fun, I don't know, play with Chwazi. And then dice rollers. There are a ton of dice rollers out there. You don't have to carry 100 dice around with you. Yes, I admit I'm a role player. I want to use my dice. I want to roll physical dice. But where this really, I found, was good was um, games that have unique dice. So Fantasy Flight Games puts out a Star Wars app. And this thing has the dice for X-Wing, the dice for Armada, the dice for Imperial Assault, the dice for the new one, Legion, whatever the new miniature game is. I don't own that one. Uh, the dice for Star Wars Rebellion, all in one app, and then a standard set of RPG polyhedrals. And you just tap what game you're playing. And what's impressive on this one is those dice work weird, I guess is a good way to put it. If you haven't played any of the Star Wars RPGs from Fantasy Flight, it has to do with dice canceling each other out. So you look at success symbols versus failure symbols, and you cancel them out. And then you figure out how many boons and banes you have at the end. Like, there's an actual skill to reading the dice. Well, the app tells you your results right away. So it's very impressive. And then something I completely didn't even think of on the blog was virtual tabletops for RPGs. These are huge. Like there's Roll20 Fantasy Grounds. Like they're big for playing like here on Discord or on Discord on Twitch and playing online, but they're just as popular for playing on the table at home. 
I know a friend who literally took a dining room table, cut out a big hole in the middle, mounted a flat screen TV, and that's what they play all their RPGs on now. And like that's some dude in Windsor, and I know lots of people do this. If you go online, lots of people have made the digital tables for doing their video games or their RPGs, sorry. And all of these are fantastic uses of tech at the table to me. Not only that, you've got, uh, as well as playing, you've got your character trackers going right yes. back to the original d and was that second ed, where they had their, you could you could manage your entire character right there. Uh, it was back when they used to send out CDs. Uh, you got the character. No. No. There it is. There we go. TSR D and D core rules 2.0. That's the one. Yep. So you know that was you know that was the beginning of it. But even down to the Excel spreadsheets, where you know you're just not scratching off uh, boxes. You're actually keeping track and all your advancements. You can be more detailed. Um, yep. For for RPGs, uh, having some form of you know I prefer it wouldn't be a phone. A tablet is more is more would be more my preference for that sort of thing, just to be able to see more detail. But uh, Right there. At, at QCC, Brett uh, from Gaming and BS, I'm pretty sure it was him, mentioned it was the first time he showed up to a table and someone had their entire character sheet for D&D was on their phone. And, like, all their powers and spells were all just, like, you just flick to find them. And he had never seen that before. The person didn't show up with pencil and paper. They right. just had their phone. At t times are changing. And I think that's pretty cool. Like, man, that PDFs of rule books. Like, I remember the bag I used to carry when I ran Warhammer at the club. Like, I'm surprised I didn't end up like some massive, huge kid just from carrying role-playing books back and forth. I'm pretty sure it's probably all the Jolt Cola and 7-Eleven uh, hot dogs we ate during those sessions that ruined that for us. But, uh, yeah, like, the sheer volume of stuff I have in my phone. Like, I literally have over a 1,000 RPG PDFs in that thing. Well, actually, it's not even in that thing. It's in the cloud, so I could get it on this thing and that thing and that thing over there. Yep. So then we move on to actual game apps. Now, most of these time, most of these, you're thinking solo play, right? You're, you're lonely fun. You're basically playing a video game. It just happens to be a board game, a video game implementation of a board game. Or you're playing with non-locals, right? You're playing Ascension with Ben Gerber halfway across the world because you've got each other as friends in the app. But there are some very solid play, like right there at the table apps. Ascension, I have played pass and play so many times, like just with my wife at dinner. But not only that, we have been downtown here. Here's a good example. We were downtown at an awesome bar, pub, whatever you call it, called Villains Bistro. Fantastic place. Gamers would love it. And Big J set up, start setting up Ascension, and we're like, Jay, it's taking you forever to shuffle the cards. Does everyone have an Android or an iOS phone? We're like, yeah, we installed the app there, and we played an eight-player game of Ascension while all just sitting there on our phones at the bar, which was great because someone spilled some beer, and that meant the table got wet. So there, there's, a to me, a very solid argument sometimes for using the technology to play. Uh, this is also great for games with lots of moving parts. So Suburbia, one of my favorite games, this is a, it's SimCity the game, though much more abstracted, using hexes. SimCity has a lot of things that can interact with each other. So you'll play an airport, and that airport is worth one point per every other airport out. And when you play your first one, it's simple, yeah, I get one point. But then you got to remember half an hour later when someone plays a second airport that yours just got better, and they have to remember that you already had one out. And then later, someone plays another thing that gets points for how many airports. And there's a lot of interactions like that that are easily forgotten and missed when you're playing face-to-face. -face. Whereas if you use the Suburbia app, it tracks all that stuff. You can't make a mistake. And that also goes to you can't play wrong so in suburbia there are illegal placements placements i've gone through a game and we're doing final scoring and all of a sudden you notice someone played an illegal tile the apps make sure that doesn't happen another example of another game with a lot of moving parts is through the ages which is uh it's sims it's civil sid meyer civilization the card game it is one of the best games i own but again a lot of interaction a lot of moving parts like i've literally sat down in my game table in my basement with four people put out an iPad in front of us and played Small World. The actual app's called Small World 2 because they reached an original, original one. People didn't like it. 
So they released part two, but it's not like it's different than the board game. I don't know what's called two, but small world two, like the small world two app. I'll never play the physical board game again because it's all these little tiny chits you have to track. Whereas on an app, you just drag your finger. It's fantastic. Uh, you and I think when I installed Ascension, I didn't even know you had it, and then you found me on it one day, and we played uh, a number of oh, times. Yeah. Uh, it's a great game. It's yeah. one of the best deck builders out it's, there. And and they got a bunch of money from me because they kept putting out expansions <laughs> and I kept buying yes, more. Yes. The, um, the first taste is free. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, along the same line, there have been over the years any number of Magic the Gathering, ver- you know, apps and games to play to play the card game. Uh, and also what I was thinking of that there was the party game for, I think it was the PS4 or no, it was a web app that it was a, you don't know Jack that we all played with phones. The Jackbox party pack. There it is. So uh, yeah, you know, games like that, which were, were a great way. We did that uh, New Year's a couple of years ago, just as a, as a pre-party thing while everyone was getting settled in before the, yeah. the board games came out. Actually, that's a really strong recommendation. They have three of them now. The Jackbox Party Pack are basically a bunch of board game style, tabletop style party games, all put through your tablet or phone, run through your TV, and or the sorry, not through your TV, through the web. I was using my PS4 on web base, and all everyone needs is a room code that's generated by the website, and then you all log into the room code and you can play the games. Now the games are stuff like uh, they're not called this, but it's Balderdash where everyone's going to write down a definition. You have to pick which is the right one. There's a version of win, lose, or draw. There was um, a bunch of trivia because of the You Don't Know Jack. Um, There was, if I remember, one of the best trivia ones were like rapid fire, just yes or no answers, where all you hit was yes or no. It was a speed game. Yeah. yeah, if I remember, you could play like 99 people or something It was allowed in that one. I was really impressed. And like I said, like, I could get out the board games, but we're then we'd all be sitting around the table and I got to shuffle everything. And we booted that thing up and we're playing in minutes. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah, I think at the time we had, we had enough for one game, but then we had extra people left over. So we just waited until we had enough to get two full tables set up. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great point. So the next one is fully integrated apps. This is, seems to be the next big thing. My first experience was a game called World of Yoho. Uh, Tom Basso on the Dice Tower raves about this game. So I had to check it out. This is a pick up and deliver anthropomorphic pirate game where you're moving around these islands, you're searching for sunken treasure, you're fighting each other's ships, you're fighting pirates, you're going to ports, you're having quests, you're doing all this neat stuff, but you're using your phone the whole time because your phone is your playing piece. The board is a big grid, all, you know, rectangular phone shaped, and you put your phone on it, and when you slide it, the little graphic of the ship slides, and it, like, has a digital version of the map on your phone. Like, it looks like there's a frame on the board. It's, It's very well done. And then it does a ton of stuff that would, again, be very difficult to track with a physical game. So like the way you're getting quests, well, no one else at the table knows what your quests are because they're only on your phone and they only show when you pick the phone up. And when you do combat, combat is uh, rock, paper, scissors based, but you don't want to know what the other person's picking. So you're choosing what type of cannonballs to use and they're choosing what kind of defense. Well, if you're playing actual cards, you get that whole, you can see each other. Whereas on an app, you can't tell what buttons I'm hitting. It was very neat, very well done. The biggest problem with that game was back then, this is a little while ago, everyone's phones would run out of battery before we could finish the game. (laughs) So slight there, there goes to the bad side of tech at the team. Well, there were also a few problems with tracking. It didn't, it didn't always get where it was only Mike's phone though. But but if it doesn't work for everyone, it doesn't work for everyone. So I I just think that might be an EBCAC error. I'd be interested uh, if, our new phones still fit as well. Everyone's phones are getting bigger. Yes, I, yes mine has gotten bigger. And, I, and I'd not. be interested to see if our phones still actually fit on the play on the squares on that one. I do still have the game. So then, of course, are the two I talked about earlier, right? Um, you got Mansions of Madness and XCOM. Like, you cannot play these games without the apps now. The app is required. So there is one downfall that was pointed out to me by many people very loudly when I published this article is what do you do if in 20 years they discontinue the app? I'm sorry, but if I'm still playing the same games 20 years from now that I'm playing now, there's something wrong with the board game industry and there's been a crash or like a nuclear war or something. And I can't get new games because there's not a lot of games from what's 20 years ago now 
1998 that I'm still playing. There are some. Settlers of Catan is a good example of an old, or more than 20-year-old game that I still play. But, you know, Mansions of Madness is not something I'm going to be playing in 20 years. Uh, XCOM, the board game, I highly doubt I'm going to want to play that again in 20 years. So, I to me, it seems like a, what do you call it, a straw man argument? Like, it's you're, you're attacking, you're arguing for the sake of arguing. Like, and there's enough non-app games that I can play for over 20 years. So I see in our chat, someone mentions they've been playing Hero Quest for over 20 years. Fair enough. Yeah, there are some, but like these two games, no. Like I guess I mentioned the Madness only has 18 missions. In 20 years, I hope I played all those 18 missions by then. Or I've already moved on to something else. So I disagree with that. The thing these apps do, though, besides just handling the fiddly bits, is bring you into the game with the ambiance. Yeah, having, uh, you know, having the ability to have that music and lighting and sound effects and, you know, even the map, right, the map underneath your phone showing through, you know, yep. uh, is, a, is a major bonus. So speaking of ambiance, something we started doing when we were playing Pandemic Legacy with Tori and Kat, who I've mentioned on the show a few times, is I don't know where I heard it, but someone talked about the pandemic soundtrack and how much it added to their experience i'm like what the heck and it's just a spotify channel and you go on spotify and search for pandemic soundtrack and at the time there weren't many now there's tons you will find a bunch of soundtracks you know it was just a matter of um loading up the soundtrack putting it on your phone putting it down and just having it play even the music just fit well for what we were doing and up the tension level just that little extra level of immersion, which I thought was really cool. So now this is something we do regularly. Uh, when we sit down to play a board game, I will often grab my phone. Actually, I tend to use Deanna's phone because she has a Spotify account. And I don't. And we'll just Google the game we're playing. Like Terraforming Mars, we found a really good one that just like funky sci-fi sound effects. And then she found another one that was mostly the Total Recall soundtrack. And they all just had that little bit more to the game. I really enjoy having that bit of themed music playing while I play a game. And then again, that's not something like besides the fact that queuing up music used to suck. Can you, can you imagine doing, I guess you could make a Terraforming Mars mixtape ahead of time and put it in your ghetto blaster back in the 80s. Kind of like those guys did for Star Trek, actually, back at the club years yep. ago. Yep. So I guess yep. it was possible, but it's not like you're sitting there. The, the biggest thing then is if you didn't like it, you were stuck, where now you can just hit next button. So another thing I did, and this is related but unrelated, my gaming room is wired up with LED lighting, Philips Hue lighting. This is something I read on an article, and I think it was the Age of Ravens blog by Lowell Francis. If I'm wrong, I apologize. Years ago about someone using this to improve their RPG experience. So what LED lighting lets you do is change the colors. If I had my phone on me, I could do it right now because I have a hue light right there. Um, so the basic app isn't, it's okay. Like you can change the colors in the room. So you can, I don't know, make your room red or you can make it darker and move the brightness up. But with the right apps, you can do really cool stuff. So some of the stuff I've done is you can set it so it's like a campfire flicker. So you're playing an RPG, you're talking about the campfire and you're doing one of those scenes where you're having everyone go around the campfire and tell a flashback story. Well, I can set my light so it literally flickers yellows and reds. I've used it where we are underwater. So all of a sudden you've got blues and purples and slowly shifting lights. I've done a thunderstorm in the middle of a game, including sound effects with a flickering lightning. One of the most memorable is I ran a game of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay where the enemy boss was a goblin who had a piece of warp stone embedded in his head and was casting spells crazily and every time it was his turn to go the lights turned green and i had the app had something called god talk or god voice the louder i spoke the brighter the lights got so i would play up this goblin and the louder the goblin got the greener the lights got, which is just really cool Another one was um, I was running Star Wars Edge of the Empire and the adventure long arm of the hut starts off with the players and a stolen freighter. The Gamorrean, there is a Gamorrean opera playing at full volume. There are klaxons going and the lights are all flashing red when you're trying to fly the ship away and fight some TIE fighters. There's also a terrible smell. 
and the players have to deal with that situation with all these interference. Well, describing that is one thing, but the fact that I was able to go on YouTube and find a Gamorrean opera, yes, go search for it, it's there. I was able to put that on, on a laptop loud. Because I had the Hue lights, I was able to have the red flashing lights, and because I had my cell phone, I had a klaxon going. My players hated it until after the game when they went, oh my God, that was awesome. Like, it was fantastic. There is no way I could have done any of those things years ago. Tech at the table right there, putting the players in the situation the, the characters are in was fantastic. Now, of course, you can use the lights for board games. The thing is, don't overdo it because with board games, you kind of need to be able to read the cards or focus on the game. So if I play with the lights for board games, it's usually um, very thematic games like Mansions of Madness, something like that. Where, or we'll be playing Star Wars Imperial Assault, and I'll play the Imperial March, and I'll dim the lights when Darth Vader shows up, but that's about it. Because really, you're trying to focus on the games. It's a different kind of immersion you want during a board game. Uh, so, yeah, the hue lighting, it can, can be a huge tool, but it can also be a, a detriment. So you need to be careful. And the same with sound effects. Uh, you you can... are blurry. Oh, yes, I am. Wow. Hello, camera. I don't know what happened to you. <laughs> My, uh, there, my, we go. there we are. Uh, autofocus fail. Uh, yeah, so uh, the hue lights are fun. Again, you need to be careful. You need to set set mood, not overpower the room. But also, sound effects are one things where people can get carried away from. You, it's really easy to get one of those fun little sound effect machines, and every time someone opens the door, you press the door open button, and every time someone search, oh, yeah. those get old real fast. So you're you're much better to set the mood and have maybe a couple of sound effects for some big moments. There's nothing wrong with that. But overuse can be a huge problem, so you need to you need to balance when you uh, when you get in with that. And then a, a couple callouts I didn't think of until now is if you go to tabletopaudio.com, that is a bunch of just ambiance sounds, and it's by setting. So you can find like busy subway, uh, Brooklyn city streets, fantasy pub. Um, Crowded Battlefield, and you can just pick one of those and have them play in the background. Those, I find, actually do work good for board games as well as RPGs. I uh, put on, we were playing Clank in Space, and I found one that was called Alien Space Station, and I just left it on the whole time. And it had, you know, little techie sounds, but then every now and then there'd be like a rumble or an alien sound. It worked really good for Clank in Space. Another is Sirenscapes. Sirenscapes, uh, for free, I don't think you get much, but if you pay for it, this is a mix of ambient sounds and soundboard, mainly for RPGs. So you can do the tavern, but then you'll also have like special buttons for sword swing and shield playing and magic spell cast and so on like that. I've seen those used to good effect. I've only played around with them a bit myself and haven't really dived in. <sighs> And so, so yeah, our next topic. So on next is accessibility. I am a fully abled gamer. Many are not. I have a follower on Twitter uh, who I follow. We follow each other named Ryan Peach. And he's my reminder. He's like my, my beacon of accessibility. Whenever I see his name, I'm like, oh, right. Ryan is blind. Ryan is a board gamer, a heavy board gamer that's really deep into the hobby and due to being blind, obviously has issues playing many games. So when first writing this article, I jumped on Twitter for a bit to gather some thoughts. I saw Ryan's name and I immediately went, yes, I need to talk about accessibility. Apps can be huge for making a game accessible. Now we talked about the hue lighting. You can use the hue lighting to make the game, the room brighter. You can set it to sunset set levels. You can also make it darker for people who have different types of vision problems. I'm getting older. I like to set it to a particular setting called concentrate. I find the blues and red, or sorry, the blues and browns a little easier to tell apart, but more so I can read the cards better. There are apps out there that will zoom in for you, basically work like a magnifying glass. Yes, I realize you could just have a magnifying glass, but if you don't happen to have a magnifying glass, there are apps that are built to help you read. There are also apps that will read cards that do image to text. This is fantastic and allows people like Ryan and other people with disabilities to play games they couldn't play without them. Again, apps like the Mansions of Madness one, the fact you can turn it so it reads, that is fantastic. So there are, I'm not an expert on them. Someone like Ryan is. There are blogs and websites out there on tools to make games more accessible. And technology is a big part of that. 
Another little uh, fun one is uh, Google Translate. If you happen to get yep. a German copy of the game, you can hold your phone up with with Google Translate and it will live translate the text right there for you as you're going. So you don't need to suffer with, with uh, without being able to read the cards. It's all there. That is cool. So I think I'm on the last one. I haven't been counting, but this is a social hobby. Now, this is the one most people are going to disagree with me on. It, social media is a big thing. Their gaming is now a shared experience and you're not just sharing it with the people at the table anymore. For many of us, we're also sharing it with the world. To me, that is awesome. I don't think there's anything wrong with a quick tweet, an Instagram picture, a table selfie in the middle of the game. What this does is it lets the game continue when the game is done. It creates memories. To me, it's the modern Polaroid. You're spreading the love of the hobby. You are sharing the game with other people. So just because we played Wasteland Express delivery service the other day, I may be talking about that game for a month because of social media shares. I share a picture of it on my Instagram account and some other gamers like, hey, tell me about that game. So the fun of that game is no longer just those moments at the table. It continues onward. I think in today's society, that's important and awesome. I love the shared experience of someone seeing a picture I posted and going, Oh, are you guys playing Long Arm of the Hut? I ran through that module. That was awesome. What'd you do when you got to the Transdotion? If it wasn't for social media, I would have never talked to this person about this game, and I would have never had that interaction without it. Yes, I realize it can be done to excess, but it's like anything else. Just keep it. Like I said, you one quick tweet, one Instagram post, you're not spending the whole time. And if you do start a conversation with someone, tell them, I'm in the middle of the game. I'll get back to you when it's done. Yeah, a lot of this can just be a, a matter of, of basic, you know, uh, just being basically uh, respectful of everyone else at the table. If you take a picture of everyone at the table, ask. If you're yes. going to tweet, tweet it and then put your phone down and, you know, check your at replies after the game. Or if someone's got a long combat or if someone needs to do uh, a hack in Cyberpunk and they're going to be rolling dice <laughs> for a little bit, pick up your phone, check a couple of things. But be Still be aware, keep an eye on the game, know what's going on, and be ready to put that phone down. Know that you are being a distraction, you have a distraction, and understand that it's it's got to be something that can be put down. The game has to come first, the phone is just there, you know, if you've got that long time break or, you know, and, and everyone's got to be cool with it. I don't think, uh, you know, if if someone's annoyed by you picking up the game and it's being a distraction from other people playing the game, that's not okay. I agree. So that was a lot of stuff. So I'm just going to recap quick. So basically tech can be bad, but it can be good. I personally think the good outweighs the bad by a long shot. The ability to access information instantly and the ability to collect data is very cool, very useful. You forget the rule book. You can look it up. You have a rule question. You get an answer right away. You can use apps to make your existing games more fun and better. There are actual games that play better as apps because it handles the fiddly bits. Then you have the very cool modern integrated games, stuff like your XCOM, your Mansion of the Madness. you got to try these games. They are worth it. And if you really think you're going to play them in 20 years, you're worried it's not going to work for you, I don't know what to tell you. Skip it. Don't play app integrated games. I personally think they're fantastic, and I don't expect them to go away anytime soon. Now, what those do is add ambiance, and there are, of course, other ways to add ambiance, like having background music, lighting, and other things app can do, like uh, the GLaDOS voice in Fuse. Fantastic. And then the very important ability of making games more accessible to more people. The more people playing games, the more gamers there are in the world, and the better place the whole world is, and we'll all hold hands and play games together. And then we'll talk about it online, because tech makes the whole gaming community more social. You're not just sharing the game with the people at your table, you're sharing it with the world and you get to interact with a larger gaming community. That is all very awesome things that tech can do for you, which I think way outweighs the fact that you might have to be like, Jim, put the phone down now and then. Yes, it can be a problem. Everyone's aware of the problems, something to address with your group. If tech becomes that big a problem, I think what you actually have is not a problem with technology, but with people. Absolutely. And there is my rant. <laughs> All right. And now going back into the lobby, we've had our uh, readership and uh, population grow up. 
We've had Shadzar having a great conversation in there, especially with Anshi Games. And now we've had Blood Boiler and Major Kayla's back. So oh, thanks, excellent. Thanks for everyone coming in. We've had a lot of talk about tech going on in there. Uh, there's a lot of negative, but there's some positive in there as well. <laughs> Again, a lot of it is just respect. You know, if your DM is turning the lights so that you can't read a character sheet, that's a DM problem. That's not a tech problem. If your music is so loud that you can't hear everyone talking at the table properly, that's not a tech problem. That's a DM problem. That's a personal problem. There are a lot of ways to use this tech in ways that enhance. And you as a group uh, need to work with the people who are controlling that tech to, to make it work for the entire group. And And maybe that is that... You know, someone's got a hearing problem and the background noise makes it impossible for them to hear. I know I suffer from from some hearing uh, difficulties and background noise can be a real problem. But you need to talk with people. And if it there's almost always a level where it will work. Uh, and if there isn't, well, then it gets turned off and, and that's fine. Uh, and the same with lighting. You know, we just need to, mm -hmm. to find balance and work with everybody. Don't assume that tech is the problem when most of the time it's a communication problem and a respect problem. So the big thing is you, I'm not here saying use tech at the table, like whatever's right for your group. And as Sean noted, get permission. Like you should all be talking to each other anyway. We're all adults. Even if you're playing with strangers, just have that conversation. Hey, do you mind if I have my cell phone? Hey, I'm going to take a table selfie. Hey, this is an awesome game. I just want to take a picture and throw it up on I just want to gram it. I think I hear people say nowadays, I'm old, I still say Instagram. Like, just check with that, right? It's cool. The answer is usually, yeah, sure, go for it, right? All right. So this was a great talk. But if you'd like to read up more on the topic, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com where the bellhop has covered this topic. Be sure to send us your questions over on the website under Ask the Bellhop or email us questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Now, Patreon patrons at the good tip or better level get their questions bumped to the top of the list. So if there's something you really want to ask and get answered right away, that's how you do it. Now, speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and thank you to our backers. Duran Barnett, thank you. Brian Kurtz, thank you very much. Joe Swick, you rock. Well, that was the double well, the real one this time. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remind, remind, bleh, yay. Remember <laughs> to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 930 Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. And our QCC episode, special episode, will be hitting at 2 a.m. on Saturday, this, this coming Saturday. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. And for those of you joining us live on Twitch, feel free to hang around as we head upstairs to the penthouse suite for our after show. You are welcome to hang around, and we will interact with the chat and look through some of this, all the stuff Shadzar has been saying. I haven't been following along, but uh, we'll be on for at least another 15 minutes to an hour, depending on how much sleep we feel we need before tomorrow morning. And remember, Wednesdays, next week, we will be back Wednesday.